Well, thank you for joining us for this edition of the Patriot Pastors Podcast. I'm Wade Lentz, a pastor at Barrel Baptist Church in Bologna, Arkansas. My good friend and co-host, who is normally with us, is not able to be here today. He is in Montana, and uh, he is enjoying the cool weather there, the cool temperatures, while I am suffering in the Arkansas sauna. And uh, it's nearly 100, 100 degrees here. If you are joining us on YouTube, you can see that uh, I have a special guest. I'm not alone. Austin McCormick is with me, and I'll introduce him a, a little bit more uh, in, in greater detail in just a moment. But before I do, I want, I want to talk about the, uh, the topic of discussion that we'll be dealing with uh, in this special episode. Uh, all of you know that we are getting closer and closer to Ju July 4th. And uh, this is going to be the 246th anniversary of uh, our declaration, the signing and the sending of our Declaration of Independence from uh, King George in Great Britain. And uh, it's a tremendous time of celebration and a tremendous time of uh, festivity as we thank the Lord for the freedom that we do have. And uh, but I wanted to talk about today. Uh, it, everyone who would listen to our podcast would understand that our nation was founded upon Christian values. It was founded upon Christian principles. Um, I'm not saying at all that uh, all of our forefathers were Christian. I'm not saying that. Um, but however, if you look at our founding documents, uh, Constitution, uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Article of Confederation, uh, you see very quickly uh, that they held to Christian values and principles, and that's really woven throughout uh, our history. I, I want us to focus in on that, uh, that our Christian heritage, but particularly, I want us to focus in on a uh, particular form or a particular aspect of the Christian heritage that we, we as a nation held on to, and that is Calvinism or the doctrines of grace that many, if not most of, of our Christian forefathers, uh, even in our country held to. And, uh, and so before we get into that, I do want now to introduce Austin McCormick, Austin, it's so good to have you here and joining us on this uh, special edition of the Patriot Pastors podcast. Uh, Austin is, uh, he resides in Owensboro, Kentucky, and uh, he has, he, he holds a Master of Arts in Pastoral Studies from Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary, as well as holding a Master of Arts in Biblical Studies from Spurgeon College of Midwestern Theological Seminary, and he is currently a MDiv student at CBTS. He has a beautiful family, his wife, Rachel. They'll be celebrating five years of marriage next month, and they have two precious children, uh, one boy and one girl. Uh, I tell you, this, this young man stays busy. As you know, as I just said, he, uh, is a student. He raises a family, but he's also a manager of media and communications at CBTS, uh, which he has and, and has for some time uh, managed and hosted the Covenant podcast. Uh, and I was a, uh, I guess you interview, interviewed me for two or three of those podcasts in the very beginning. But you recently had a much bigger host than Wade Lentz. Who was your latest uh, host or, or guest host that you had on your podcast? Uh, as we're recording this, the most recent uh, interviewee was uh, Dr. Stephen Lawson. And uh, our co-host, Dewey Doval, had a friendship and relationship with him. So we were able to record an episode with wow. him on expository preaching. That's great. And, uh, and I would say that, uh, you've had other guys like, uh, Dustin Binge, 
Um, who, who are some other, have you interviewed Tom Nettles? Is that one that I yeah, saw? We've, we've recently interviewed Tom Nettles. Um, we've, uh, regularly talk with the president of CBTS, Dr. Sam Waldron and, um, Dr. Lane Tipton. We've had many, uh, recordings like that. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend the podcast. It is a very well done, uh, podcast that really, uh, hones in on these, uh, the tenets of the 1689 confession of faith and, uh, a, a great tool for, for learning, uh, about different Bible doctrines and so forth. Uh, but again, Austin, thank you for joining us on, on this special edition. Uh, going back to our topic today, as we're talking about the Christian influence of our nation, particularly the, uh, the aspect of uh, Christianity, of those who hold to a high view of God, uh, a.k.a. Calvinism. Um, a lot of times Calvinism has... Uh, you get a lot of hostility toward it. Uh, if you mention the name, people, you know, get hostile toward that. Uh, Austin, I, Austin, I'm hoping that you can kind of clear the air and uh, maybe tell us what Calvinism is and tell us what Calvinism is not. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, let me say, brother, it is great to be with you, and I'm thankful for the privilege to be interviewed by you on this subject. And let me begin answering this question by saying that although not all Baptists are or have been Calvinists, Calvinism is certainly not new to Baptist life. Right. Uh, You asked part in part of your question what it is not. For Baptist life, it definitely is not brand new. In fact, many of the most historical Baptists were Calvinist. Um, for instance, the well-known Baptist pastor, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who is appreciated by both Baptists and non-Baptists and Calvinists and non-Calvinists, once said this, I have my own opinion that there is no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless we preach what nowadays is called Calvinism. It is a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. It is um, or it is a nickname to call it Calvinism, I, as I just mentioned. I do not believe we can preach the gospel if we do not preach justification by faith without works nor unless we preach the sovereignty of God and his dispensation of grace, nor unless we exalt the electing, unchangeable, eternal, immutable, conquering love of Jehovah, nor do I think think that we can preach the gospel unless we base it upon the special and particular redemption of his elect and chosen people with Christ wrought out upon the cross. Mm. So if you are interested to find that quote that comes from the New Park Street Pulpit, Volume 1. Calvinism, then, is a nickname for a historically articulated and related set of doctrines about salvation that teach that salvation is completely by grace alone and not by works. It has common nicknames like the doctrines of grace or sovereign grace um, or tulip, or particular redemption, particular atonement. That's that's why I've been grinning a little bit mm-hmm. when we're talking about Calvinism and we're using the word particular so right. often. But um, <laughs> John Calvin was not the one that came up with these points as they are pre- presently articulated in the way that we have them. Hopefully, all Calvinists would point to God as the divine author of Scripture who has revealed these doctrines through the, the writing of um, divinely inspired men like the Apostle Paul and John to give us these doctrines. But historically, they were articulated as a response to the remonstrance at the Synod Mm -hmm. of Dort. So interestingly, the five points of Calvinism did not uh, derive with them. They were responses to what was articulated as Arminianism. Yes. So to clearly understand Calvinism as it is now nicknamed, one should read the Canons of Dort. So the acronym TULIP comes from the five points 
which make up this acronym T, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, and P, perseverance of the saints. But if we were to summarize what those five teachings, what those five doctrines teach in relationship to each other, Calvinism teaches that before the foundation of the world, God has chosen to save and elect people, not by anything that he foresees as good in them, but according to his own good pleasure and his own mercy and his sovereign decision. Sin has completely corrupted the ability of man to do anything pleasing to God in his fallen state. Therefore, God must give grace for someone to be saved. And God has given his son to die for these people that he has chosen. He has sent forth his Holy Spirit to effectually call these chosen ones to himself. And this will not fail. God's purpose is sovereign and it will be accomplished. Well, as I conclude this, uh, this answer, let me just rattle off a few misconceptions of Calvinism by referencing Dr. Sam Waldron's blog article that was released later this year called 21 Misconceptions of Calvinism. I won't read all 21 of them, but perhaps some of the more well-known misconceptions of what people think Calvinism teaches, but it actually does not. Um, here are what people accuse Calvinism of teaching. But again, this, these are not what Calvinists believe. One, Calvinists don't believe in free will. That, that one's just silly. If you read the 1689... Right. Uh, chapter 9, there is an entire chapter about what uh, confessional Calvinistic Baptists believe about the doctrine of free will. Right. Two, Calvinists don't believe in human responsibility. Three, people who want to be saved cannot be. Mm -hmm. Four, Calvinists believe the elect will be saved no matter what they do in this life. No, they must believe in the gospel. Mm -hmm. Five, Calvinists believe all babies are going to hell. Right. Six, Calvinists don't believe in evangelism or missions. Seven, Cal, Cal, uh, God saves men against their wills and is dragging mm. them into heaven. And of course, there are many more accusations that can be said, but for the purposes of sure. our conversation, I perhaps uh, will leave off the rest. Yeah. I appreciate that. And so we could say in summary and in essence that Calvinism holds to a high view of God and a low view of man. And um, this belief, uh, this this aspect of Christianity was was held uh, and really shaped our country in its early years. And it is true that our country in its conception was rooted in Christianity, yes, but specifically, our nation held to a biblical form of Christianity that had a high view of God. And uh, so, someone may ask, well, how did this view come to the Americas? Well, uh, this, this form of Christianity, this doctrine, uh, uh, first made its way to the North America in 1620 when the pilgrims first landed at uh, Plymouth Rock. Uh, the pilgrims were Puritans. They were separatists and uh, they were Calvinists. Um, that's very, uh, that's just factual information that anyone can easily find. Um, uh, they were led by William Bradford, who was a Puritan separatist pastor. Uh, he, along with um, John Robinson, who was also a a Puritan separatist pastor, uh, helped uh, form uh, a, a form of government, the, the Mayflower Compact and all of that. And so even in our nation's first settlement, uh, it was a people who held uh, to a strong and high view of God. They believed in the sovereignty of God and they believed in divine providence. Um, but Let's fast forward uh, a few years, a hundred or so years uh, to the 1700s. And let's talk about the really the great spiritual awakening that took place during that time, which featured a couple of wonderful pastors, preachers uh, 
uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, both of whom were Calvinists. And uh, so let's talk about that time period and tell us a little bit about Jonathan Ed- Edwards. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start this answer by saying that I know less about George Whitfield just because I've read less and I haven't been um, giving myself time to study George Whitfield, but I do know that um, he strongly influenced Charles Spurgeon and mm-hmm. encouraged Martin Lloyd Jones and his preaching style to be evangelistic and was certainly Calvinist, as you mentioned. And he was an itinerant preacher who preached much across the United States during this time period that you mentioned. But because I don't know as much about George Whitfield, I wanted to focus more on um, Jonathan Edwards for that question, if that's okay. And I suppose if you you wanted to say more about Whitfield, you could. But uh, a lot could be said about Jonathan Edwards. He was not a Baptist, although my historical theology professor and church history professor, Tom Nettles, said in a course that he taught on Jonathan Edwards that quote, Edwards would have made a great Baptist. Mm -hmm. This was in reference to the arguments that Edwards made against unbelievers being able to be uh, recipients of the Lord's Supper in the midst of his controversy at the end of his ministry at Northampton. But let me say a few things about Edwards' life, then perhaps his theology and how God used him in the Great Awakening. So first, his life. Edwards was born on October 5th, of 1703 in East Windsor, Connecticut. His father and grandfather were both congregational pastors. He had 10 siblings. All of them were girls. Four of them were older sisters and six of them were younger sisters. When Jonathan Edwards was six years old, he began studying Latin. He entered Yale College at 13 years old in 1716. In 1720, he writes uh, his miscellanies, which is his way of systematizing all of his thoughts of studying through scripture and theology. And just four years later, in 1724, he earned his Master of Arts from Yale. Uh, In April of 1727, he was ordained as a minister of the gospel at Northampton. And also in that year, he married his wife, Sarah Pierpont. He saw amazing things, and we'll talk more about what the Lord did through his ministry there when I get to the part of the Great Awakening. But in 1748, he was dismissed as the pastor of Northampton related to his uh, communion controversy. Um, If that's something you want to talk more about, we can, but I'll just briefly say that um, he was teaching against the view that his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, uh, propounded about inviting unbelievers to the Lord's Supper as an evangelistic means to bring about their conversion. Um, Jonathan Edwards staunchly held that only believers were recipients of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. And so because of his teaching and because of some other controversies and um, the congregation's lack of trust in him, they eventually dismissed him. But because of his giftedness to preach, even after he was dismissed, he was invited to continue to fill pulpit. So... There was at least some humility there to be able to go back to the church and continue to preach. Right. But in 1750, after he was dismissed, he began his ministry to the Indians in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And during this time, he would write some of his most popular works. And um, I'll talk about the dates of those in just a moment. Uh, then in 1757, seven years later, he came to become the president of of Princeton. Mm -hmm. But this was very short lived because he died uh, in 1758 on March 22nd due to being wrongly inoculated. He was wrongly vaccinated and this quickly brought about his death. So that's that's a little bit about his life. Um, I'll talk about his theological works real briefly. Some of the most well known ones that aren't directly sermons are Religious Affections, which was written in 1746. The Freedom of the Will, which was written in 1754, The Nature of True Virtue, 1755, and Original Sin Defended, 1758. And then another one that is uh, popularly known is The End for Which God Created the World. That was 
published in 1765, but that was mm-hmm. after his death. So someone, I'm not certain off the top of my head, um, got a hold of this and published it after he died. And of course, perhaps one of the most well-known things that we have written or produced by Jonathan Edwards was his well-known sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God that was used by the Lord near the end of the first great awakening um, to bring about the salvation of of his people. Um, Mm -hmm. The sermon was preached in 1741, as I just mentioned. Um, Some of the dates that Dr. Nettles gives for the first great awakening, uh, this event whereby God poured out a spirit and miraculously converted many uh, at in a quick amount of time was 1734 to 1736 and then a brief break in the middle and then again 1738 to 1741 so uh this sermon that was preached was preached in 1741 near the end of the first great awakening although it was originally preached to the congregation at um northampton if i'm not mistaken Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about this sermon that the Lord used to awaken people to salvation. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. The text that was preached was Deuteronomy thirty two thirty five, and the phrase that begins this sermon is, "Their foot shall slide in due time." Mm. The message was about men not being in hell at this very moment because of God's mercy of holding them up from going down to that place of torment that they deserve. Wow. Vivid pictures and illustrations are used in this sermon, including a spider hanging over fire by one singular spider web. And similarly, then the picture points to fallen man dangling over the pits of hell and hanging on from going to that place only by the single thread of God's mercy. Another theme in this message is the continual usage of the word sensibility. This is huge in the thought of Jonathan Edwards. Tom Nettles defines sensibility in Edwards' thought as, this is long, this is a long statement, but this is Edwardsian. (laughs) Edwards would often make long statements like this. So sensibility then, a state in which both the mind and the affections are convinced of and approve of a biblical idea as if the senses themselves had recorded it on the consciousness of, or as an invincible and indelible fact. Hmm. So, so for Edwards to have saving faith, one must be sensible that he is poor and blind and naked and wretched and conversion alone produces a new sense of divine things or an affection of new nature. Yes. So this this is a little bit about the sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached that um, took place during the first great awakening. But if it's okay, I do want to spend a little bit more time talking about um, how Edwards had a longer lasting impact, not only in the first great awakening, but on other Baptists. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So as I just mentioned, Edwards was not only used in that short time period there for the first great awakening. Um We, uh, I love Baptist history. Um, Mm -hmm. I know you're a Baptist pastor, so I know you have some affinity towards that topic as well. Uh, Michael Haken writes the following about Jonathan Edwards' influence on one of my favorite particular Baptists, Andrew Fuller. Um, After the scriptures, Edwards' writings exerted the strongest influence on Andrew Fuller. Not only did Edwards strongly influence Andrew Fuller, but Edwards also strongly impacted several of the English particular Baptists of the 18th century. So Edwards not only had an impact here in America during the First Great Awakening, but he also had an impact across the pond and what the Lord would do in a group of small backwater Baptists Mm. that would assemble to take the gospel to the nations. Yes. Tom Nettles writes, according to the universal testimony of this circle of friends, the Baptist Missionary Society that would partner together for the propagation of the gospel, Jonathan Edwards played the largest role in lifting them from their perplexity. Mm. And there was a modern controversy during that time about if 
one should offer the gospel to the non-elect. And so to summarize how Edwards so greatly impacted Andrew Fuller and the other particular Baptists, Edward helped Fuller to see a distinction between natural ability or inability and moral ability and inability. So if I could um, just compare some other theological views, the Arminian sees man as naturally able to make decisions. He chooses to drink water. He, mm -hmm. he chooses to do things. Therefore, since he is a creature of choice, this implies from that that he must also be able to make decisions that are morally good decisions or morally good spiritual uh, decisions, even in a fallen right. state. So for the Arminian, um, natural ability implies moral ability. Mm -hmm. The hyper-Calvinist sees man as morally unable to make a good decision, and therefore the hyper-Calvinist does not freely offer the gospel because he thinks it would be unfair to require of man what man is morally unable to do. Well, right. Edwards helped the particular Baptists of the mid to late uh, 18th century distinguish between natural and moral uh, ability. So for the particular Baptist, the more moderate evangelistic Calvinists, both in the Great Awakening, like Edwards himself, and across the pond in the 18th century, even though man is morally unable to repent and believe the gospel in his fallen state, it is, it is his duty to do so. Mm. In other words, ministers should call upon right. unbelievers to repent and believe in the gospel, even though in their fallen state they can't do so. Right. So Edwards was greatly um, used to impact these Baptists, so much so that they were sometimes accused of preaching too much Edwards instead of the mm. Bible. Yeah. Some people said, and, th and that's the accusation we hear, isn't it, whenever we talk about Calvinism. If we sure. use any jargon that is about Calvinism or any of these points, or we use terms like effectual calling or particular redemption, we're told, why don't we just use the Bible? Hmm. Well, that type of an echo of an accusation is also being used in Edward's time, or in, excuse me, in Andrew Fuller's time. And so I want to share this last story before we move on, uh, and then um, you can take it where you want. But near the end of Fuller's life, Fuller not only commended Edwards in his writings, but he also defended the frequent quotation of him. Tom Nettles writes this, the insights and spirit of Edwards became so pervasive that by the end of Fuller's life, some complained this, if Sutcliffe and some of the others had preached more of Christ and less of Edwards, they would have been more useful. Wow. And this is how Andrew Fuller responded. If those who talked thus preached Christ half as much as Jonathan Edwards did and were half as useful as he was, their usefulness would be double what it is. Mm, that's great. So that's, that's a little good. bit about the impact on Jonathan yeah. Edwards and Calvinism in America and across the pond. Yeah. And, and wow, that's, that's a tremendous information about Jonathan Edwards, who was so influential uh, in, in early America. And uh, he, along with George Whitfield, uh, George Whitfield was a Calvinistic Methodist. And uh, you don't hear any more Calvinistic Methodist today. I think they died out with Martin Lloyd-Jones. But uh, uh, anyway, um, George Whitfield was a, a greatly used evangelist of the Lord. He, he preached more in the South than Edwards was able to do. He preached in Georgia. North Carolina and, uh, saw great meetings. Um, I mean, he would open air preach and it has been documented to where he is preaching to 15,000 people, 20,000 people just out in the open. And, uh, so he had to have a, a massive voice to, to have his, uh, uh to be heard by all those people. Uh, and, one of his, uh, well, we think about uh, forefathers of our country. We think about Benjamin Franklin. Uh, 
And uh, Benjamin Franklin's favorite preacher was George Whitfield. And uh, that's not to say that Benjamin Franklin was a Christian. Uh, he was a deist, as was many other um, forefathers. However, he was intrigued by George Whitfield's delivery and the sermons in which he preached and the, the passion in which uh, he called sinners to repentance. And uh, um, most of every time that George Whitfield preached, he cried in the middle of his sermons, and he had a heart for the Lord. He had a heart for the lost. And again, this is what shaped our country, and uh, this is what shaped our early America. And it's really amazing. If you are familiar with Abraham Kuyper, who was a, a Dutch Reformed uh, 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 from that era of in, in 1898, he uh, gave a series of lectures called Lectures on Calvinism. And um, he gave these lectures uh, to Princeton University. One of those lectures he gave was on Calvinism and politics. And I, I would encourage you to read it. It's, uh, it's very good information. But more or less, he just makes the point that uh, that. Uh, the tenets of Calvinism, having a have view of God, uh, makes everything healthier and stronger. Um, if you think about it, when our nation held to such a view, now we're going back to uh, the Pilgrim 1620 until uh, really the, the mid to 1800s, uh, America was a stronger nation morally ethically and I, i'm not saying that everything was correct okay i'm not saying that there were a, a perfect nation by no means but something happened in the mid to late 1800s where there was a tra a, a change of direction in the uh, the certain aspect of the sovereignty of god and uh, this thing of, of what we're calling calvinism um charles finney came on the scene Easy believism came on the scene, revivalism, um, altar calls, all those things uh, transformed our country, transformed the church eventually. And instead of having a high view of God, it, it transitioned to the American people having a higher view of man and putting more power upon man than, than God himself. And we are reaping the results of that today. And really, Abraham Kuyper's lectures are, are just stating that, hey, Calvinism, a church holding to Calvinism, having a higher view of God, and nations having a higher view of God, holding to that view, are better because of it. And, uh, and I, I, I would agree 100% with Abraham Kuyper on that. Uh, you and I are Baptists. Uh, let's talk about the influence that Baptists had in early America, and primarily speaking about Calvinistic Baptist churches. Um, how many Baptist churches were there during this time period, and how many of those Baptist churches were Calvinistic? Pastor Ron Miller of Covenant Baptist Church in Clarksville, Tennessee, has a podcast called Particular Pilgrims, and he did an episode similar to the question you just asked me. So I'm going to summarize some of the material that he uh, gives the answer for in that uh, that topic on that episode. So that way I'm not accused of um, stealing any information. This comes from right. Pastor Ron Miller. So um, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, as many of your listeners probably know, is the Credo Baptist, Baptist version of um, the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Savoy Declaration that is thoroughly Calvinistic. Mm -hmm. And this document was brought to the Mid-Atlantic colonies by the Welsh Baptists in the late 1600s. And some that would hold to or that brought this document would eventually form the Philadelphia Baptist Association. Um, if you read the Philadelphia Baptist Association or the Philadelphia Baptist Confession of Faith, um, it is very, very similar to the 1689. Um, perhaps someone that's more knowledgeable about this would tell you the exact um, 
di- differences, but I know at least that it has two additional chapters in it, and that is the laying on of hands and the singing of hymns. But if I'm not mistaken, I haven't read the document recently. It is identical previous to the addi- additional yes. um, uh, articles within it. Right. And the influence of the two additional articles that were in the Philadelphia Baptist Confession of Faith that were different than the 1689 came from the influence of Benjamin Keach, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Benjamin Keach believed that the laying on of hands was a third ordinance of the church. Mm -hmm. And although the hymn singing controversy was not original to him, it predated him. He is commonly known as one of the uh, key proponents of the hymn singing controversy in England. Um, He had a controversy with a man in his own church named Isaac Marlowe. And because of that hit in his church's confessional documents, they're very strongly emphasizing these, these two things, the laying on of hands and the singing of hymns. Well, that influence comes from England as Mm -hmm. his son, Elias Keach is formative in the, uh, addition of these two articles. A little bit more could be said about Elias Keach, another Baptist, comes to America. I'm summarizing uh, very hardly here now. Comes to America to escape the religion that he grew up in and is a hypocrite. He comes to America needing employment. And so he mocks his father's mannerisms and is filling pulpit to basically survive and live while he is over here. And at some point, He falls under conviction as an unbeliever while preaching for his hypocrisy. And the Lord used his own preaching as the means to bring about his salvation. But the um, Elias Keech is formative in the Philadelphia Baptist um, Association, I believe, and then would later plant a church in or would be a pastor of a church in Pennepec in the north. And then uh, eventually... The 1689 or the more Americanized versions of it that have different names would come down to Charleston, South Carolina. The First Baptist Church of Charleston is historically known for its Calvinistic influence. Um, First Baptist um, Philadelphia as well. Um, This document, the 1689, so dominated Baptist life in America that Baptists who used it were called regular Baptists. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Many yes. because of the SBC and Southern Baptist life, many people probably have never even heard of regular Baptists. But regular Baptists were those who held to Calvinism. Mm-hmm. And That's so, right. a statistic that you asked about was how many churches were there and how many of them were Calvinistic. Again, this statistic comes from the particular podcast or pr- particular Pilgrims prog- podcast. Excuse me. But from the 1790s, over 90% of the 870 Baptist churches in America claimed a Calvinistic creed. Wow. So 90% of 870 churches were Calvinistic in their creedal documents. Mm. Transitioning into the beginning of the 19th century... Uh, you have the founding of the Southern Baptist Convention in 1845. One, The first president, William Bulane Johnson, is a Calvinist. Um, right. Many many of the Calvinists to come after that are R.B.C. Howell, um, P.H. Mell, um, James Boyce. These men, some of the earliest Calv- or presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention in a row, were Calvinists, which explains the Calvinistic founding of some of the Southern Baptist theological seminaries. Um, The church I mentioned earlier, First Baptist Charleston, South Carolina, is where James Boyce uh, Mm -hmm. came from. So you have many influential men that not only were influential in their day, but wrote extensively, and we have access to their writings. Um, So that I think that's sufficient for now, because my next answer is going to be much longer. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's interesting that that is uh amazing some 90 percent of the churches and that was during 1800 
1790s. In, in the 1790s, 90% of the 870 Baptist churches claimed a Calvinistic creed. That's remarkable. That is. Speaking about the Baptist and also our most famous forefather, George Washington, uh, was apparently, some say it's just a legend, some say it's true, some say, nah, I don't know. Some say that George Washington was baptized by a Baptist pastor by the name of John Gano. Uh, tell us about that. And if that's re really a remarkable story. Uh, we know uh, Washington was first baptized as an infant in the Anglican church. But tell us about this story of uh, him possibly being baptized by a Baptist pastor. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to do that. Uh, the late Terry Wolliver, who was pastor of Sovereign Grace Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri, and who edited and published many books by a publishing company that he was formative in uh, beginning called Particular Baptist Press, has written a helpful book about John Gano. It's called The Life of John Gano, 1727 to 1804, Pastor Evangelist of the Philadelphia Association. Uh, that's in case any of your listeners want to mm -hmm. access it. I reference his work up front because my comments will come directly from his book. So this is not my scholarship. This is me mm -hmm. curating what someone else has already dug digging up. But in the past, uh, I have seen paintings or at least a picture on social media of John Gano yes. being baptized by George Washington. Perhaps some of your listeners have as well. But I couldn't find much information about this supposed event until I purchased the book that I just mentioned by particular Baptist press. It is a big book mm -hmm. starting on page 451. Wolliver has basically a functional chapter, which is at the end of all of his other chapters. It's an appendix called did John Gano baptize George Washington? So this is wow. helpful information for us. Right. And to simplify Wolliver's view, this is what he writes. I believe today, nobody knows for certain, nor is it likely that anyone will ever know, at least mm. on this side of heaven, whether the baptism took place, despite any confident assertions that, that may be made either for or against this event. The given information that we have available cannot be proved to have occurred, nor on the other hand, can it be proven not to have occurred. Right that I have seen no convincing argument to date that would justify an outright dismissal of the overall testimony of the original affidavits in support of this baptism. So in this chapter, a man named Elsie Barnes provides a few statements from family members of John Gano, whereby they testify that John mm -hmm. Gano did indeed baptize George Washington. So I want to read some of these for you. One of them is notarized by the state of Kentucky, by the way. So this is notarized wow. testimony. Wow. But the first one is by Stephen Franklin Gano, who lived in 1807 to 1901. And he wrote the following from Georgetown, Kentucky on August 16th, 1889. I am the grandson of Reverend John Gano, now in my 83rd year and the brother of Miss Margaret Ewing. I was raised from my fifth year to manhood by Miss Margaret Hebel. I have heard her say that her father baptized, immersed George Washington, mm. S.F. Gano, M.D. On the same day, Margaret Ewing, her statement was notarized by the state of Kentucky, wrote the following. To whom it may concern, I, Margaret Ewing, she was a Gano. Mm hmm aged 90 years last May, being of sound mind and memory, make this statement. I have often heard my Aunt Margaret Hebel Gano, the eldest daughter of Reverend John Gano, say that her father told her that he baptized General George Washington at Valley Forge, to the best of my recollection. Uh -huh. She, Miss Hebel, also said, that General Washington, for prudent reasons, did not desire that his baptism should be made public. Reverend John Gano was a chaplain in the Revolutionary War and an intimate personal friend of uh, General Washington. And then the third quote, another family member named 
Richard Montgomery Gano, 1830 to 1913. He's more uh, well known for R.M. Gano, wrote the following on March 27th, 1891 from Dallas, Texas. Mm. The tradition in our family of the immersion of George Washington by my great grandfather near Valley Forge, I have heard from my childhood and have never had any knowledge of anyone doubting it until my attention was called to a recent fact. That was due to the fact, partly, that George Washington demanded it in a quiet way and wished not to demonstrate uh, a demonstration be made over it, and partly to the fact that it was not according to Baptist usage to immerse anyone who was not being received into the Baptist church. Mm. So he questions whether it would have been true that Gano would have even been willing to baptize George Washington if he wasn't going to be baptized into the membership of a Baptist church. True. But it, interestingly, within this testimony, R.M. Gano states on his testimony that he remembers 42 people specifically being there. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it is helpful to know when trying to answer this question that, that at least three family members have testified that this event took place, or at least they heard with the best of their recollection that's that this mm-hmm. event took place. Yeah. But Terry Wolliver presents r- multiple reasons why it could be very likely that this event did not take place. And then we'll leave the reader with what they, th- or the listener to whatever they think of it. So first, yes, there is no record in any of the voluminous papers of George Washington that such an event occurred or is even hinted at second there is no record or hint of the event in john gano's biographical memoirs published in 1806 Mm. third john gano was not at valley forge during the winter encampment but was with clinton's army encampment at albany yes yes Fourth, Stephen Gano, 1762 to 1828, was the only one of John Gano's sons to enter the gospel ministry and had served as a surgeon's mate in the Revolutionary War. And there is no mention of the event in Stephen Gano's Sermon on the Death of George Washington, published in 1800. Fourth, David Benedict, 1779 to 1874, was Stephen Gano's son-in-law, as well as a Baptist historian. And although Benedict did include an extended biographical essay on John Gano, among the other ministers in his general history of the Baptist denomination in America, published in 1813, he makes no reference to the baptism. Hmm. There is also no mention of the event in the subsequent editions of his general history, nor in his autobiographical work, 50 Years Among the Baptists. And then the last reason, there is no record of the baptism written by any of the witnesses that said that are said to have been present. So we don't know the identity of them, with the possible exception of Daniel Gano, as named by R.M. Gano in the uh, third testimony that I mentioned above. So even the Virginia Baptist minister who R.M. Gano heard related the story is unnamed. So did... John Gano baptized George Washington. Here's the answer to my question. Definitely, maybe, or <laughs> probably <laughs> uncertainly. Wow. And um, so where does this picture come from? I want to talk about that a little bit as well. This is also an, an, another appendix from um, this book that I referenced above. Perhaps you've seen the picture of George, uh, John Gano baptizing George Washington. Mm-hmm. This portrait was commissioned to be painted by a man named Edward T. Samford. His years of living were 1840 to 1922, but the artist who actually painted the picture is unknown. Samford, who commissioned this picture to be painted, served as a a captain in the Union Army, and he was also a pastor of North Baptist Church of Manhattan in 1908, whenever he commissioned this painting to be made. Hmm. Wow. The original painting, where it is right now, is at William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri. Dr. William Lampkin, who is a professor and director at William Jewell, informed Terry Wolliver, the author of the book that I've mentioned, that the college received this painting in 1926 
by a woman named Mrs. Elizabeth Price Johnson of Kansas City, Missouri, who is a great granddaughter of John Gano. Mm. In the mid 1920s, William Jewell College was in the midst of a building pro a program erecting its first girls' dormitory, a new mag, uh, a new gymnasium, and a new college chapel. And Miss Johnson, the granddaughter of John Gano, offered to make a major contribution to the construction of this chapel upon three conditions. First, the new chapel building would be named John Gano Memorial Chapel after her famous ancestor. Oh, wow. Second, the college would maintain a small family cemetery near Excelsior Springs, Missouri. And third, a painting of her famous ancestor baptizing George Washington should always hang in the new chapel. Oh, my goodness. So Dr. Lampkin, who is a professor there at William Jewell College, writes, Even though we cannot tell today if the actual story of John Gano baptizing George Washington is true or false, the painting is indeed real and continues to hang in an office at Gano Memorial Chapel on William Jewell's campus. That's very interesting. You know, I always thought, you know, I, I've heard that John Gano baptized uh, George Washington, and that was just fact. But after, you know, listening to what you have to say and, uh, and, and me doing some research just prior to this, yeah, there's a lot of evidence to say that I, you know, prob he probably did not uh, baptize Washington. Um, and one, one of the biggest evidences that he did not was that the fact that the government says that, Hey, Gano was not even stationed at Valley Forge. He was not even near that, that vicinity. So, uh, wow. Uh, you just burst my bubble even more, man. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. But when I study Baptist history too, and I see how great the Baptist tradition has been in the past and I see, uh, what it is now, at, oh, yeah. at least at large my bubble is often popped too. Oh man. Hey, we'll, we'll find out in heaven one day, you know, we'll understand it better by and by as the old song says, well, Austin, thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of the Patriot pastors podcast. As we get ready to celebrate July 4th and we think about our founding, uh, think about our Christian heritage and, and think about the, the fact that, uh, all throughout our documents, you have the 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 mention of our God creator and uh, the divine providence and all of those things. But think back even more to uh, the strong view and the very high view of God that the majority, the vast majority of the people had, and uh, especially within the the church leadership there. And we, we hear folks all the time say, well, we need to get back to our roots. Well, if you want to get back to your roots as far as a, a nation is concerned, get back to ha holding a biblical view of salvation and a biblical view of who God is and, uh, and, and a biblical view of who we are as men. And, uh, and so we, we pray that in the days to come and, Austin, I think you would agree with me. There has been in, in recent years, a revival of the doctrines of grace. There has been a revival of, uh, the nickname Calvinism and those who hold to the tenets of Calvinism. And to me, that is very encouraging. It, it's not that we're drifting off into some, uh, new doctrine. No, we're just going back to the doctrines of old. Uh, the doctrines of our forefathers. And so it's something, it's, it's nothing that we should be afraid of or run from. It's something that we should study, look at scripture and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to, to grab a hold of us and to teach us uh, this, uh, this truth that uh, the Bible teaches about the sovereignty of God. And so again, thank you guys for listening to this special edition of the Patriot Pastors Podcast. Until next time, God bless you.